keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you? If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Hey there, everyone. So this is going to kind of be the first of a two-part video that I'm going to be putting together on this particular topic. Um, I decided to because, for one thing, some news items came out recently regarding this specific topic and kind of touched upon some of my connections to the issue itself. Now, the issue is unions. So this is going to be part one. And in this part, I'm really just going to be Basically telling the story of my experience with the Union, which should help sort of explain some of the insights I offer later on. Now, I want to say at the beginning of this that I am in fact pro-Union. I'm not pro-big labor, which is sort of the fashion that much of the labor movement exists as today. But I am in fact pro-Union. I believe that both workers and companies are best served when workers have some level of negotiating power, because when they do, and when fair contracts are negotiated between labor and management, not only are things such as wages and benefits hammered out and somewhat assured, but typically workers that are well treated and feel as though they have a voice within a company are more dedicated to that company and therefore work more proudly on behalf of it. Now, I know, I know. All the old memes and jokes about six supervisors watching one hole get dug are rather inevitable, and there are naturally issues that arise when unions get too powerful. However, as a basic principle, I believe that worker organizing, collective bargaining, and labor negotiations are altogether good things for both workers and the companies that they work for. Now, that being said, I'll first allow the anti-unionists amongst us to screech in frustration and rage quit my channel. Then I'll move on to point out that what I'm about to say, both in this story as well as the follow-up video about the issue itself, isn't said in spite of my support of unionism, but actually because of it. Because what I'm about to say isn't an attack on workers, unionists, organizers, or anything other than the bloated and corrupt Walmart of the labor movement that is SEIU. Now, for those who are not familiar... SEIU stands for the Service Employees International Union. It is a union made up of service sector workers, which can range from nurses to groundskeepers, from daycare workers to security guards, and of course, in certain circumstances, even state workers. Now, the problems with SEIU are numerous. In fact, I'd say they're too numerous to really list off even in one full video, but for the purposes of this video, I will at least cover the ones getting press, as well as those I know somewhat of personally from my time as an organizer with them. So I suppose I'll start the story here with my own experiences. A little story time video, if you will. In 2010, I was taking a break from professional politics. Out of my own and down on my luck, I began working in construction, first in residential demolition, and then later at a concrete factory where we cast municipal tea walls and pump boxes and other sorts of shelters and municipal project stuff. It was a pretty thankless job. The pay was low, the hours were long, the work was grueling, and management routinely violated health and safety regulations as they employed almost entirely underpaid temp workers and undocumented migrants, all of whom they were confident would never complain. Now, it was actually at this concrete factory where my second day on the job I was told to scale up the outside of a 40-foot bin, basically, into which uh, you dump sand and salt, and then shimmy down on the inside using, uh, I believe it was only one or maybe two uh, little planks before a ladder was dropped behind me. It was it was pretty nightmarish, and that was only one of many, many times that lives were put at risk. In fact, there was one time I remember where someone with absolutely no training was using the sky crane, or the, um, the, the crane we had suspended from the ceiling, to foist um, one and two ton objects around, uh, causing them to swing wildly. It was a great time. But 
It was towards the end of a highway T-wall project that myself and nearly all of the other temps were unceremoniously fired over the phone after an 11-hour Friday shift. Now, I was relieved to a certain extent that I'd never again need to hear the distempered groaning of the project manager with every ounce of his divorce-oriented malevolence just being brought to work each day just to be shared with the rest of us. And I wouldn't be forced to recast um, the one-ton form either due to the tax accountant who had been hired to work the mixer fouling up another batch of concrete. However, as easily as it had been to swallow the indignity of working in such a place while employed, the utter disposability, both in regards to the safety at work and my dismissal from it, did leave a rather bitter taste in my mouth. Now, it was seemingly poetic that no sooner had I hung up from the call where I was fired than I found sitting in my email an invitation to apply to be an organizer with SEIU. The first round phone interview came a few hours after my resume had been submitted, and the official hiring came a few weeks later. Now, to clarify, this was not just some random act of the cosmos. I had been subscribed to numerous leftist political job sites and had even previously applied and even previously worked with SEIU, actually, as a contract organizer with their political action committee. Now, in the political contracting world, finding that full-time staff employment position as opposed to jumping from contract to contract is really the goal for a lot of people. Regardless, though... I had, after many years, landed the job as a full-time traveling union organizer, and I was really looking forward to it. So the first deployment was to organize home-based nurses in southeastern, uh, southwestern rather, Pennsylvania. Now, it was there that I really first came to understand what the details and the practices of labor organizing really were. And honestly, it's also where I came to really discover the virtue to it. Now, the terrain we were working in was really hilly. This was deep Rust Belt country. And uh, most of the areas we went to were exceptionally poor as well. Now, often my trainer and I, uh, because we'd go out in pairs, we'd find ourselves deep in the country, you know, driving for sometimes up to an hour just to speak to a single worker. Now, in these conversations with women who on average made about minimum wage And they were billing out at a capped level of 20 hours a week, even though they were usually working upwards of 40. I really came to appreciate the sorts of selflessness and humility that accompanied doing that kind of good work. And time and time again, as we attempt to sort of ply the standard questions about wages and benefits and hours and time off and all of that, the nurses we were talking to would just always turn the conversations back around asking if by forming a union that they could better somehow advocate on behalf of their patients and advocate for things such as newer equipment or outing days into town uh, with, other, with other clients and patients, and, and really just all things that were quality of life related in respect to the people that they were caring for. And, and these people were some of the most genuine people I ever met. Now, in one of the most genuine experiences of these, I found each conversation with them caused me to work a little bit harder each time. After, though, it was about a month after, the organizers, myself included, on this campaign, we were all pulled and we were sent off, um, sent up to work yet another campaign. This one, however, was not actually of a labor organizing um, uh, variety. It was actually a political organizing campaign. And this time we were seeking to organize a movement against then-Governor Scott Walker up in Wisconsin. Now, the center of the campaign was around a proposed light rail system that would have connected Milwaukee um, with uh, Madison. Sorry. And this would have potentially created thousands of jobs. Now, Walker had shut this down for a myriad of odd reasons, but the biggest one really seemed to be a sort of fashionable fuck you to Obama, who was um, attempting to push out a stimulus package which focused on infrastructure. It's funny how infrastructure spending suddenly became a popular idea just a a few years later. But it was during this campaign that, even though I... Myself and so many other organizers had signed up to organize workers. Uh, We found ourselves basically doing the sorts of things that ACORN used to do. 
the sorts of things that community organizations usually do, which is going door to door in low income, high crime neighborhoods and trying to rally the, the community together to, to make a basically an astroturf, uh, an astroturf political movement. Now, this same campaign actually exists today. It's called Wisconsin Jobs Now. And don't be surprised if you don't see that mentioned here or there, depending on the time of year and depending on the publication. But not to digress too much further, we spent several months there in Wisconsin, door to door, day after day, sometimes working 10, 11 hours straight, just trying to organize these movements. And eventually, after a couple of weeks, we managed to organize roughly around seven or 800 people that we bust out from Milwaukee to Madison to help ring the Capitol in a protest against Governor Walker's inauguration. Now, I've told a similar story in the past about this being my first experience with the black flag anarchists. This was the same demonstration. Once we'd achieved that, it seemed as though after about a month or two that it was again time for a shakeup and everyone was to be redeployed once again. Now, what happened in Wisconsin ultimately ended up being an occupation, namely by the uh, other sort of competitor union of SEIU, at least on the state side, asked me. And that's all history and the story for another time. But I was actually myself sent uh, immediately down to Florida, down to Fort Lauderdale. And while I was there, I was unceremoniously kicked off of that campaign after two days when a very, let's call her, bullish, masculine lesbian who clearly didn't like white people or men decided just without reason that I wasn't right for the campaign. Now, when I was sent back, I was told that it was because I don't understand the struggle of the working classes, which was something that I was told in Wisconsin by my handler at the time, a a stocky woman named May, that uh, because I was white, it was impossible for me to understand the struggles of the working class, or what it was like to be poor. (laughs) Joke's on you, May. But, so, once again, bounced off campaign, was told to wait. This time I was deployed then to, um, well, first to Minneapolis, and then off to Rochester, Minnesota. Now, I keep getting redeployed, and you're probably wondering what the point of all this is. Well, in their rush to be diverse as they could, SEIU was very keen to throw organizers around more as a matter of principle than practicality. Imagine this, if you will. For those of you who've seen my face, take about 20 pounds off of me, a bit leaner, maybe a little more gaunt, far more tired, dressed in a black pea coat in the middle of February in rural Rochester, Minnesota. I'm tasked with talking with home-based daycare workers. And while myself and the other staff members, three of whom were young black men, probably the only black people in Rochester at the time, had to go independently up to these doors where it was just one woman and a house full of kids that she was watching, knock on the door with clipboard in hand and somehow convince her to take time away from watching the kids to let me in the house so we could sit and talk about a union. It didn't go over too well. Soon, though, after... A good amount of complaining, I was finally sent off to a real worker campaign, and this is where things get really interesting. Being shot down to Philadelphia, I was sent to work with the SEIU local known as 32BJ. I don't know where the BJ came from either, but maybe somebody just had a sense of humor. But 32BJ specializes in security and groundskeepers. In fact, there's a particular blogger from a particular borough of a particular city, who's a proud member of uh, 32BJ, and um, talks of it often when he's not pretending to be a police officer. Again, I digress again, though. In Philly, working with 32BJ, we were tasked to organize the security workers of Allied Barton Security. Now, in our conversations, we did indeed find out that these were people who were making 8 or $9 an hour, had next to no real benefits to speak of, and were oftentimes being made to do things which were in excess of the stated duties and contract that Ally Barton had. Things like patrolling the far north side of Drexel University and crossing Spring Garden, because once you cross Spring Garden, you get into a much different territory than Drexel has, for those who've maybe not been to Philadelphia. This was, in times gone by, the site of fire bombings, and was routinely also the site of muggings, drug deals, and all sorts of other 
Hmm, shadowy activity. I spoke to a number of security guards who were actually sent up there and ended up being beaten, robbed, and in one case even stabbed, with the company doing next to nothing about it or adjusting really any kind of uh, patrol parameters whatsoever. But as I spoke to these workers, I also came to find out that 32 BJ, an SEIU, had apparently attempted to organize in Philadelphia four times before this one. And that each time, as soon as a sweetheart deal was struck between the brass and the office and the corporate board, all of a sudden, whatever workers had come out in support of the union were generally sort of sacrificed, left to be fired or transferred to a site so far away they'd have to quit. It took me naturally quite a while to get these workers trust. Once I did, though, they really were still a bit cagey about the whole thing. After another month of working, up one time I worked two and a half, two straight 18-hour days uh, before collapsing. But finally they began to actually come out and talk and come to meetings. Now that's an essential part of organizing a union, is when you get individual workers to agree to come to meetings that you hold either in a cafe somewhere, a bookstore, or perhaps even at the office itself. But once they take their own time to come to one of these meetings, then you know that they're at least somewhat motivated to take the steps to actually organize that 50 plus 1% they need for a union. So where's all this story going? I know, I've been rambling. It's getting there. As soon as they began coming out and actually attending meetings and I was showing some form of progress, I was inexplicably pulled from the Drexel University site and sent off to another series of different sites around Philadelphia to organize workers from a different security company. Now, these workers had not been previously talked to, so to them it was all a fresh concept and all very exciting, and getting them organized took next to no time at all. But curiously, when I had a nice, healthy meeting of roughly about 15 or 20 different security guards there to learn about what the benefits of having a union could be, I was pulled aside by the campaign head, a man by the name of Neil Diaz, and told that I don't, that I needed to actually stop organizing them. He didn't want any more of them signing cards or actually joining the union. When I asked him why, he said it was because they were probably going to have to burn them. It was then that I found out that the entire campaign that I had been reassigned to in Philadelphia was nothing more than a ruse to try and put some pressure on the allied Bart and corporate uh, heads to come to a negotiating table with the SEIU brass so they could hammer out another deal between them. I really didn't like the idea of selling workers out. And I liked the idea even less that the same sort of union who would sell them out was supposedly taking on the workers I had organized at Drexel, those who would come out knowing that SEIU had fucked their predecessors over, but were going to give it a shot anyway because they were working directly with me. Now, I was receiving regular text messages and phone calls at the time asking where I was and why they hadn't seen me, and I began going up and paying, my, and paying visits to the workers that I'd spoken with at Drexel. They had then told me that no one had been around, despite having been assured myself that someone would be taking over the turf and taking over the information and picking up right where I left off. It was about this time that it became clear that 32BJ, and especially Neil, didn't really like me being there. It was also in conversation that I'd heard him having with another campaign head, where he was saying that he'd love to get some pussy in on this campaign, you know, bro? Yeah, it is that kind of environment with that guy. Soon enough, though, another transfer was coming through. I was being pulled from Philadelphia and sent curiously back to the one place that I had stipulated in our negotiations to begin with that I didn't want to go, back to New Hampshire. Wondering what in the hell kind of campaign I could be working in New Hampshire, especially after working with very low-wage workers who were usually doing heavy, if not important, work, being grossly underpaid and neglected by their companies, I had to wonder what sort of what sort of worker base in New Hampshire could there be to organize of that nature. And then I found out the administrative and technical staff of UNH. Going out to the college campus, my job is not to meet with the groundskeepers or the janitors, the food service personnel, or any of the actual laborers or the working class stiffs at the university who desperately wanted union representation. No, 
I was there to speak to people building satellite components. The local, as it turned out, had selected this group of people realizing that at their given average salary rates, that if we were able to establish a union pay, uh, with dues-paying members from their particular uh, circles, <laughs> that the union would be well-funded to continue its political efforts. I was summarily fired when that campaign went under, and to be honest, there was no saving it to begin with. But it was after this that an interesting sort of uh, series of events unfolded. Uh, for weeks, I had attempted to contact 32BJ in Philadelphia in attempts of actually securing the full-time position that they were advertising on uh, various different job sites. And uh, never, never a returned call, not once. No return calls, no return emails, right up until... It was a couple months afterwards, and a call came in from a Philadelphia number that kind of looked familiar. Answering it, I discovered that it was one of my leaders, one of the more active security guards at Drexel. And he was calling to ask where I had been. He said the time was coming soon when they'd be submitting all of their cards to the state and looking for recognition from the state as a bargaining unit, a union. And that no one had come to see him since I'd left. This was months. When I pressed him on it, he said there had been some people sent out to disperse and then collect union cards. But other than that, no one had shown up. He said, too, then, that there were rumors circulating that SEIU had brokered a deal with Allied Barton, that they'd be able to organize the union, but that they'd hold off on going for... that uh, uh, they'd hold off on actually filing with the state, at least to allow Allied Barton time to fire the more troublesome workers they didn't like. They were basically giving them a grace period to clean house, and then they'd let SEIU roll in, organize what few workers remained without issue, and then move on. More fucking workers over, in the name of making money for the union. I instructed them to burn their cards. In truth, I told him just to go down to the union hall because he thought I meant literally set them on fire. I said, go down to the hall with everyone, demand your cards, and then tear them up and throw them away. Do not join with SEIU. He took my advice, and then a week later, good old Neil Diaz called me out of the blue, asking me if, well, insisting that I turn over all the information I still had from Drexel, all my contacts, my leaders, and everything. I asked him why, and he said that was union business. I asked him about the rumors, and he said, Listen, oh, you think they'd be better off without us? And I told him yes, and I hung up. About a month later, I then saw a news item in, U in Labor Notes. It's a union news blog of sorts. Ooh, to find out that Allied Barton Guards at the, I believe it was Temple University or UPenn, had outright rejected SEIU. Having previously joined, they tore their cards up, reorganized in the same ways that we taught them to, and then established their own shop unions, proving that they had the majority within their workplace on their own without some gold and purple uh, umbrella union supporting them, supposedly. And um, they got recognition and then went into bargaining. Now, I've told you all of this because my experience with SEIU as an organizer has shown me that they are crooked through and through. SEIU itself is actually so abusive to its own staff and organizers that there is a union for union organizers. It's called UUR. This came about because so many organizers were being used as chattel by a union which claimed to respect employers, or employees rather, and claimed to respect the struggles of the workers and the working class, yet couldn't stop abusing and exploiting their own workers. If it wasn't for senior organizers trying to fuck junior organizers, or certain seniors and supervisors of, let's say, Mexican or African-American descent, telling all of the whites in the room that they couldn't possibly understand poverty or struggle, Right up through the actions of fucking their own workers over and then fucking the workers that they were organizing over. It was funny because remembering back when I first lost the job at the concrete factory and was hired on by SEIU, the initial 
deployment was meant to be to California. What I'd learned afterwards was that the deployment to California was SEIU literally staffing up and using union organizers to break union organizing efforts on the behalf of nurses from California who wished to have their own union and no longer be a part of SEIU. Now, again, I've gone over this because SEIU, for those who don't know, is as crooked as it gets. And I'm saying this not to bash SE, to bash unionism itself, but actually because unions in general and the labor movement, I feel would be best served if SEIU was to just die and go away. Now, though that's not likely to happen overnight, as we'll see in the next video, it does seem as though it's coming because so much of the botched sets of priorities that those in places of power within this union have, those which seem to see the worker base itself and the infrastructure of the union not as a way to advance the cause of workers' rights, but as a way to advance racially themed social justice ideals. It has not only actually failed to accomplish what it is they set out to do, but it has largely failed to protect the union from shrinkage. So, I appreciate you sitting through this part one. I hope you don't mind me just sort of diving into a story of mine in order to sort of set the stage a bit. Part two will be a little bit more involved, and we'll be looking a little bit more at exactly how it is that unions such as SEIU are both corrupt, as well as how that corruption is starting to feed their downfall. So, short of all that, thank you all for your time, and I will see you in the next piece. Cheers. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't be in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves, to make a trap for fools.